Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA, home of a Department of Geological Sciences at Central Washington University. Thank you for tuning in for this program. We're broadcasting live at the moment, and we're looking at the title slide of the presentation today, To Mix or Not to Mix? Details and timing of magma storage, recharge, and eruption at Misty Volcano, Peru. Our speaker, one of our own, Marie Tekach. I hope that you enjoy this episode. Thank you, Jordan, for the water. So it looks like we're five by five, which means loud and clear. Let me get on camera and we'll let everybody know what's going on, especially if you've not been with us before. Let me switch the cameras here quickly. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Here's to you for joining us today. Thank you for joining us. So the local time is 11.48 a.m. on Friday, February 9th, 2024. My name is Nick Zentner, and I'm your host for this presentation. And if you're watching this in replay, as most of you are, the talk will start in about 11 or 12 minutes from now. So in replay, you can go ahead and fast forward to the next chapter title at the beginning of Marie's talk. But, but, but we have viewers that are live. And let's say hi to a few of you here today. Before I swing you around and give you a sense of the room, there's a nice, nice crowd again today. We've got a good thing going here with these Friday noon talks. Where are you viewing from? Gordon is in Glasgow, Scotland. Carl is in Rogue Valley, Oregon. Bitterroot, Montana. Everybody's saying hi to Vinman's Bakery? Yes, Jeff from Vinman's Bakery. You gotta love it. Vinman's Bakery in beautiful downtown Ellensburg delivered a whole spread of danishes and I forgot to, I forgot to bring a couple things in. I was gonna show you some of the Vinman's products, but I, they're all gone by now. People have been out there enjoying. Santa Monica Pier says Jack, good afternoon. Minneapolis, Minnesota, Springfield, Oregon, Marinette, Wisconsin, sunny, sunny Tri-Cities, Washington. Thankfully, we are sunny here as well. DuPont, Washington, Palatine, Illinois. San Sebastian, Spain. The Malacca Slide, hello, Sharon. Sunny Natchez, Washington, hello, Pat. Richard is in Vienna, Austria. Boise, Idaho, Eugene, Oregon, Fabian, Alberta, Spokane Valley, Washington, USA, Web Lake, Wisconsin, Forest Grove, Oregon, Lincoln, California, Zoltan is in Budapest, Hungary, Friday evening for you, hello, Texas Panhandle, Hillsborough, Oregon, Dublin, Ohio, and so on. It's freezing in Norway. It's minus 32 degrees centigrade. You guys hang in there now, okay? It's going to get warmer, I promise. I don't know. What? Boulder, Colorado, and so on. Okay, so I guess my microphone's working okay. Um, let me swing you around and uh, have you get a sense of the room here. We've got... I mean, every time we do this, there's a little bit more participation. There's a little bit more energy... It's a cultural thing that we've tried to establish here, Hannah Shamlu and, and myself. And uh, I mean, if you go back and watch some of these Friday noon talks last year, the room was half full and people just weren't in the habit of doing this and didn't maybe even really see the value in getting everybody together in a room, but that is the case now. So thank you for joining us. We'll start the program in a few minutes. <coughs> Yeah, there's dead bodies under the blanket, John. You got a problem with that? 
Hello? Yeah, you do an announcement for um, alumni Zoom app directly after this, like walk from here to room 321. 321. Or if they want a Zoom link, just message me like right now, and I'll send them the link. If there are alumni that are watching this, no, okay, I'm a little confused. Help me out. Sorry. So there's a Zoom with alumni. Okay. With the 487 students. Got it. Um, 487. Yes. Okay. The current students in this room are yes. invited if they would like to attend. Okay. In person. Yes. 21. Okay. If they want to attend via Zoom, I need to send them the link. Okay. Thank you. 321. 489. 487. 3, 321. <laughs> Okay. Okay. <laughs> Chris, would you like to tell a story to our home viewers right now? Tell a story? Uh, uh huh. And then what happened? Um, well, one time, yeah. I was in Hawaii okay. with my grandparents. Yeah. And I was eight years old, and my parents told me that they were leaving the hotel room to go do something and my grandparents weren't around. But being a nine-year-old kid, I wasn't really listening. And so I woke up from this nap I was taking and uh, I didn't know where they were and I got scared and I was in my underpants. So I went down to the lobby of the hotel room in my tidy whities searching for my parents. And I was walking down the road in my tidy whities and these two guys in you know, black, black and white tie suits came up to me. They're like, are you Christopher Crane? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, your parents are looking for you. And so in my tidy whities, I walked back with these men in suits to the hotel. They reunited me with my parents and grandparents. Oh, thank God there's a happy ending to this yeah, story. Yeah, it was great, yeah. My God, you really came through. You told us the story. It had <laughs> a beginning, go. a middle, and an end. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Chris. No problem. Attaboy, you really came through. <laughs> oh, the old tidy whitey story. You gotta love it. Bryce, you wanna tell a story? Okay, I won't come over you with a the microphone then. We meet again. It's been quite a while since I've seen you, Nathan. Yeah, it's. I honestly just don't do well. I just do what I need to, and then I kind of feel around. But but yeah. you're here today. Yeah, I get. Well, I've always had things going on. Like last week, I had something to do. But I do try and good make time for these. Good. Yeah, well, I'm glad you're here. Yeah. Yeah. It's always like. We did go up to the AME. Oh, you went on that, yeah. Yeah. And Good. We, there was a few of the talks about um, similar to the things here, but a lot more figures, a lot more numbers, and a lot. Yeah. And I was, was, I, was, was able, I was actually faster too. It was like yeah. rapid fire facts. Oh sure. It was yeah. just for stockholders and stuff. So. Right. And I was actually able to like kind of follow what was going on. Good. That's a nice feeling, isn't yeah. it? It was really cool to like actually see the implications in my head of like what all these numbers mean. I'm glad you went on that trip. Oh yeah, it was, it was great. Yeah, well, it's good to see you again. Yeah. Wasn't that long ago? You were in 101, sitting yeah. right in here, man. That wasn't that many quarters ago. Yeah, it was only last year. Last year. And no, we can only imagine what, what you'll be doing next winter or next year. But I'm it'll so be. Excited. It's good. I'm so all right. Excited. Good to see you. Good, you? What's the latest? Give me something interesting happening in your friend group. You guys are the core scene of your group, right? You're, you're kind of, would you call yourself sophomores? What are you? What are you? Juniors? You're juniors. Of course you're juniors. I think most of us are going to go on senior field this summer. Oh, you are? Yeah. Yeah, it's usually like a 50-50 I think, yeah, the majority of us are. Okay. That's a big thing. That is a big thing. Because the rumor got to you somehow that possibly we were not doing Summerfield next year. No, really? 
it's a small possibility. Okay, so so if you're yeah. leaning that way anyway, I yeah. think that's going to be. Yeah, I'm ready for this summer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Very good. Thank you, Jasmine. Hi. How are you? I don't remember your name. Carla. Carla. How are you? Good. How are you? Fine. Have we have we even chatted? You've been here like nine months I think already. Only a little bit. Um, when we went on the 502 trip. Oh yeah. It was just so brief. And that was like ten years ago. Yeah, it probably so long feels ago. like. Right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. How has it been going? It's been awesome. Is it? I don't think I want to go back to Texas. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah. I really like it here so far. <laughs> it's a good thing. Yeah. David's a good guy too. He is. Yeah. You know, everybody's so, so sweet. Like I don't have anything bad to say about my experience here. Nice. Yeah. And who are you working with again? Chris. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're all set up for this summer and, and mapping yeah. or whatever? Um, I'm not sure what I'm going to go do out on the field yet, but we're going out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, Carl. See ya. Ashpakash Ash Bagash. Ash Is that insensitive? Is she hot? Yep. She's hot. <laughs> We're working with live ammo. We've got live ammo. All my keys. Okay, uh, viewers, uh, can you hear Marie, Marie please? You. Marie 555? Five 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 mark? So the doodles. I'll think about it. <laughs> Delay in the comments. Yes. Marie, See, five that's what by I five. found on mine, but then Marie? I have all the lab keys that is always a little inconvenient. So I'm like, oh, sorry, I gotta go back and get that. That was pretty cool. Yeah, what we were doing, um, so I guess. Would you mind the typing Marie, iron, five by five? I think magnesium was thank another you. one. Is basically thank you, looking Oscar. at the proportions of them okay, to say yes, okay, it formed in this good. environment. Yeah, Marie's a little soft spoken, um, but she's gonna try her best to project. Yeah, Thanks, but I don't remember which. Just about but a minute. She was like, or so. yes, so that must have formed in a lake or like something like that. Yeah. And then, yeah. The green pumice, though. Is that super weird? Is that really? Yeah. Like, I don't think if I looked at it right away, I'd be like, pumice, unless I looked at that stuff. Exactly. Or the texture yeah. here. God, my hands are really dry. Getting shaky. So many. <laughs> Do some dry human. Just, just a little. No. Yeah. Why not? Just pour from I was making myself last one, laugh when I was practicing last night. I was, I was saying this. There's no, one, there's no one there, and I said, for what I assume will be a great turnout. Thank you all for joining us. I think so. Yeah. So this. Okay. Yeah. If I. I'll try my best to remember the the laser pointer. Yeah. Thank you. Can I move that? Can I not move that? Just need that. Got the laser pointer on. See how long I remember to use it. You're fine. Okay. Okay for me to start. Sure. You got it. You got it. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming this afternoon. It's so nice to have so much energy in this room. So grateful to you for making time for us here today. We have one announcement, and then I will talk about the, uh, well, no, let's make this announcement first. So we have one more lecture in this series for the winter quarter coming on March 1st. That's three weeks from now, right? March 1st. So the last a talk of the winter quarter, March 1st. It's a geothermal energy talk given by Anthony uh, Schoen over at Spokane. He'll be driving over for that. So we'll make sure that many know, even the university president, we'll make sure he knows 
Uh, and all of you know about that geothermal energy talk. March 1st. Okay, great. Before I introduce our speaker today, I have one announcement that I barely understand. So Bree is going to like talk into my ear as I go. Hey, are you interested in doing something at 1 o'clock today up in room 321? And if you are, physically go up to 321 because what's going on in there are alums from our program who are talking to people about their jobs. <laughs> and wait, this just in, if you are not going in person but you want to join by Zoom, you need to message Bree soon. On your phone right now, message Bree so that she can send you a Zoom link. Yeah, they're all, this particular panel of alumni is all people with master's degrees. Master's degrees. A wealth of information, don't miss it. So yeah, if, if, if today, if the, the hour lecture is not enough for you and you're insatiable and you want more, room 321, as soon as we're done here, we'll see you upstairs. Thank you. Anybody else got any announcements to make before we start? At 4.30 today, Cornerstone Pizza, we're going to have a dinner with our speaker. So you are all welcome to join us. There'll be a table reserved. Hannah, what do you figure? Ten? Even more? Who knows? We'll see if the wait staff is interested in dealing with us as a large group again at Cornerstone Pizza. You've got to love it in beautiful downtown Ellensburg, Washington. So... 4.30 today, love to see some of you down at Cornerstone Pizza. Our speaker today, Marie, grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, born and raised, bachelor's degree at Allegheny College in, Pitts in Pennsylvania, got a master's degree at Central Washington <laughs> University, and her advisor was Wendy Borson. Uh, she is a PhD candidate at Oregon State University, studying under Frank Tepley, and she's currently the lab manager, the Murdoch Research Lab Manager, on the third floor of this building. This is a talk entitled, To Mix or Not to Mix, Details and Timing of Magma Storage, Recharge, and Eruption at Misty Volcano, Peru. Would you help me please welcome Marie Tekach. Hey, thanks, Nick. And thanks, everyone, for being here today. Um, I'll say, how Nick mentioned, I got my master's here, and I definitely, when I was a grad student, didn't imagine ever getting to come back to Ellensburg, let alone this department. So I'm really excited to get to share with you what I've been working on uh, for the last few years with my PhD on this gorgeous volcano called Misty, uh, which is in Peru. And hopefully this is a project that I will be wrapping up here very soon. <laughs> So I probably don't have to tell this crowd twice that with volcanoes, we have volcano hazards. Um, I love this USGS Oh, and I said I was going to try my best to remember that we have a pointer on here. Doing great. Yes. Um, I love this USGS poster that summarizes all of our volcano hazards. And I'm just going to use the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens for our context here, uh, which had a volcanic explosivity index of five. And we don't need to have a super eruption for these um, hazards to be detrimental to human beings and human, um, human lives. So for things like tephrafall deposits where we've got a big eruption cloud and eruption column and cloud, these tephra are carried uh, with wind currents and then basically rain out on the land uh, like snowfall kind of. Um, and this picture down here is from Afreda, Washington, where it's, you can see on the clock, it says six o'clock, it was 6 p.m. and it looks like nighttime. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we can have roof collapses if too much of the tephra uh, builds up on the roofs and it's a lot of weight. It's bad for breathing, it's bad for crops and animals, so there's a lot, a lot of uh, detrimental things that come with that. There are also the ground hugging hazards like pyroclastic flows and lahars uh, that get funneled down the valleys and topographic lows. And then things like debris avalanche collapses um, where we get that pretty classic hummocky uh, topography. And Misty is a volcano that is active, and it's produced all of these hazards over and over again throughout its eruptive history. Um, so Misty lies in the central volcanic zone of the Andean Arc, which is in this black line here. And it's erupted typically andesites, dacites, and rhyolites. It's called the Andes for a reason. There's a lot of andesite. Um, if we zoom into this box, square box here, we're uh, zoomed in on southern Peru, where all of the most recently active volcanoes and the Holocene volcanoes are. 
and MISTI is highlighted in that um, filled in triangle there. There are a few reasons, uh, just generally, why we would want to study MISTI. Uh, one of them is that I was kind of surprised to learn that of the eruptions uh, that are either VEI 5 or greater, um, there's not a whole lot in this zone that are actually documented in the literature. But uh, the most recent uh, Plinian eruption from MISTI was a VEI 5 that we refer to as the 2K eruption. Uh, the section that I'm going to show you today has two more VEI 5 eruptions, all in, and all three of these erupted in the last 20,000 years. So we know that they're occurring, they're just not very well documented. MISTI also shares similar processes uh, with some of the surrounding volcanoes that have erupted in the last decade. So this is Ubinas erupted in 2019. It's just to the southwest, or sorry, southeast of MISTI. And then Sabancaya to the northwest uh, that's erupted on and off since 2016. So we can kind of use them to learn about each other and the regional activity in southern Peru. Um, and it is relatively accessible. You might lose a tail light. You might get stuck on your way out of the field uh, when you're tired and hungry and you just want to go home. Um, but there are a bunch of these service roads for the power lines in the area, so you can really cover a lot of ground just by truck. Um, so this is really great compared to um, some of the more remote places like Sabancaya. And Misti is the icon of Arequipa. So Arequipa is the second largest city in Peru. Um, its population has grown to more than a million in the last, let's see, it's more than doubled in the last 40 years. And just for uh, reference, Seattle is about 730,000. So it's larger than Seattle by a pretty significant amount. The city center is right about here. Um, and there's more than 10 feet of elevation gain to get up to the summit of Misty. Um, so we're pretty dang close to this volcano. And then I've added in this kind of white line to just generally mark where the limit of, of people, how far people have moved up the volcano. Yes. <laughs> Um, and it's, it's a continually growing population. So now I've got the most recent hazard map up here where we've got in red is the highest volcanic hazard down to the lowest in the yellow. And I've oriented it to kind of match up with uh, the view that we're seeing here on Google Earth. Um, and just to orient you, this little kind of triangular area I think matches up with this. So basically everything past that towards the volcano is moderate to high, yeah, in the path of moderate to high hazard zones. And you might notice also all of the drainages that are coming down and around the volcano with different um, rivers and small tributaries, um, and they all lead right down into the city. So it's just not a great combination there. Uh, you might be wondering what, what Misty has been like in the recent past. Um, it's got an active fumarole, so we know that there is um, some shallow magma that's degassing down there. Um, there's a, a permanent seismic network, so it's always monitored, and then there's a gas geochemist that will periodically go up to the summit, which is not a small feat, and uh, measure that fumarole. Um, so we should know if MISTI is exhibiting some stronger signs of life. Um, this most recently happened in the 1980s. There was a period of heightened activity, and then it just kind of went back down to, to background levels. Um, so there's clearly there's good reason, there's more than a million reasons to keep a good eye on what's going on. Um, and the last eruption was a pretty small one in the 15th century, um, but there were Incan people nearby and it really uh, messed with their crops and disturbed a lot of their lives. So what's been done on MISTI so far um, includes this really broad mapping campaign where they um, kind of delineated the entire eruption history of this volcano with a lot of argon dates um, and figuring out, you can see the pre-MISTI deposits are kind of down here and then working their way up to see um, the sequence of events, basically. There's been some work trying to delineate the general tephra stratigraphy for a few tens of thousands of years, and then some geochemical studies, including on plagioclase and just whole rock chemistry, again, on the entire history of the volcano, just to kind of um, uh, give us a good synopsis of what MISTI has done in the past. And on the flip side of that, there's a few studies that are in really, really fine detail of single eruptions. And there's just a few of these that have been done. Um, the most well-studied one here is, like I said, that most recent Plinian eruption, so Mount St. Helens sized, 1980, Mount St. Helens eruption sized, um, where the physical volcanology has been worked out really well. And I love this picture with the geologist for scale down there. <laughs> and those are um, a combination of, I think, lahar and pyroclastic flow deposits. And then there's a complementary study, a petrological study to that to characterize what we think happened to those magmas before they erupted. 
So for my dissertation work, I was kind of trying to split the difference between the level of detail of whole entire volcano or just one single eruption. Um, so I studied 10 of the most recent explosive eruptions. And to give you a little bit more context for that, um, that 2K eruption um, is right here in the stratigraphy in what we call the Pacheco stage. So there's nine preceding eruptions for that down to this one, Autopista. And the 2K has this gorgeous banded pumice. The nine times out of 10, if you pick a piece of that tephra out of the, the hillside, it's gonna be banded. And what Tepley and others proposed is that there's an andesite reservoir somewhere at depth um, and a, a shallow rhyolite crystal mush. And at some time um, in its history, the andesite reservoir intruded itself into the rhyolite and they interacted prior to eruption. Um, and then they produced that, that Plinian eruption. So for my research, what I wanna know for the rest of the Pacheco stage preceding that 2K eruption um, is how, how do the processes recorded in these magmas compare to that most recent one? And including what is triggering those eruptions. I wanna know more about the magma storage system or the magma plumbing system, if you wanna call it that. Um, and I've generated a lot of thermobarometric calculations or estimates, excuse me, for that. Um, and then can we put a time scale to any of these processes? And we're gonna spend the most time on this number one today and we're just, you're gonna see this figure over and over again, you might get sick of it, um, but we're just gonna keep filling in the information for what we think is going on in that subvolcanic uh, system. And just to make sure that we're all starting out on the same page, just a few definitions. Uh, the first one is just thinking about how are the different ways that we can alter a magma composition. And collectively we call these things RAFC or recharge, assimilation, and fractional crystallization. I'm gonna focus the most on recharge today. Uh, for one, it's a well-known eruption trigger, and it's an eruption trigger that we have a chance of actually detecting at the surface. Um, and magma recharge is a well-represented process at MISTI, or in the Pacheco stage at least. So recharge is when we've got two separate magmas sitting in the crust. They've both got their own composition of melt and crystals and volatiles. Um, and for, um, at some point, the lower magma can achieve enough buoyancy, make its way through the overlying crust and then intrude into the overlying magma. And then now you've got these two magmas that are exchanging their um, melt and crystals and mixing together and then we get a new composition or multiple new compositions. And then magma recharge results in magma mixing. And magma mixing is just the general term for when we have two magmas coming together and interacting. So I'm gonna split that up one more time into the end members of magma mingling and magma, uh, magma hybridization. Um, so magma mingling occurs when we've got two magmas that are uh, very different viscosities. So initially when they come together, mechanical mixing is formed or is preferred. Um, and with this, we see textural evidence left behind where we've got these different tephra erupting from the same eruption. You can see these nice little blobs of one magma within the other and that produces what we call bimodal magmas. Hybridization, on the other hand, is when two magmas have a lot more similar viscosity contrast, or a lot more similar viscosities. Um, so homogenization is preferred between them. Um, and this can be a little bit more difficult to track because we don't see textures like these left behind in the actual hand samples. And then we can look to crystals to try to, to unravel what these magmas experienced prior to their eruption. And in today's context, um, just to be clear with this, I'm using the term mingled when we have a bimodal glass, which you'll see here in a little bit, and then the term hybridized when we have a glass with just one type of composition. And I love a good food analogy, so we can use our hot fudge and our cold ice cream here. I'm gonna slap some sprinkles on there, those are gonna be our crystals. And then we can think about this kind of mingling and hybridization spectrum. Um, so the, the hot fudge is gonna be our hot mafic magma, the vanilla ice cream is gonna be our cold felsic magma. And you can see, you know, once you drizzle that fudge on, you don't instantly get a new product. You can still see we have the hot fudge and we have the ice cream. But as the, see, as the ice cream is cooling down the fudge and as the fudge is heating up the ice cream, their viscosities are coming, are getting a lot more similar, basically. So now we can promote some of that hybridization. Um, and you can see some banding going on down there. And then if you were to picture this, just sitting out at room temperature, maybe give it a little stir. Um, at the end of the day, you would have some hybridized mess of chocolate vanilla something. 
um, and then the sprinkles are still in there just to be our crystals and they're, they're, they're surviving through the whole process or at least some of them are and we can get some information from that. Now I mentioned the deposits that I'm studying are from Tephra Falls again where we've got that eruption column and cloud and then the Tephra falls um, onto the surface kind of like a, a snowfall you can think of. And so here's an example of some of those that you can see are kind of a nice layer cake in this hillside here. Um, and I'll point out my uh, PhD advisor, Dr. Frank Tepley at OSU, who's a petrologist. Um, and we were working, uh, collaborating with Dr. Chris Harpel out of Cascade Volcano Observatory. And he's a physical volcanologist, and he's the one who's really been mapping out and chasing out these deposits and kind of figuring out the stratigraphy. And then we're, you know, doing complementary work together on the same set. So we're not super high tech with this. I've got a garden trail and um, a Ziploc baggie. I'm just sampling this tephra out of the hillside. Very excitedly, as you can see. Um, we can we take those home and describe what the textures that we see in hand sample. Take it a step further, make them into thin sections, um, and then we can analyze the composition of the glass, which glass which represents the melt of the magma and we still got crystals in there which are of course still the crystals from the magma um, and then take it a step further and just look at individual crystals and what their textures tell us about what that magma um, has undergone prior to eruption and one of the reasons that I'm only focused on these tephra fall deposits is that right now they're basically the easiest of the deposits to work out what their eruption sequence was. Um, compared to lava flows or pyroclastic flows that get funneled down the valleys and are kind of um, uh, more locally contained, the tephra fall deposits are regionally dispersed. And in fact, this yellow star here um, represents an area where this entire section is exposed together. So even though we only have two um, absolute ages of about 20,000 years and 2,000 years for all 10 of these deposits, we can be pretty confident that this is the sequence of eruptions um, based on the, the exposures of these. And this is just a photo for an idea of what the field sites look like. I think this outcrop is maybe two meters high. Got, again, all, this is all just um, alternating tephra fall deposits and some paleosols. Um, and then, of course, Misty in the background. It's not a bad place to work. And then looking at a few of these deposits more close up, if you'll notice, some of them are fairly small, just a few centimeters um, in thickness, where other ones are pretty substantial, like this uh, autopista and the lower sandwich eruption here. Um, and I'll point out that the deposits highlighted in red, including these two, are all VEI-5 eruptions. So again, that 1980 Mount St. Helens sized eruptions. And if you were doing the math looking at this, um, that's at least one explosive eruption every 2,000 years or so. So Misty is really churning out these explosive eruptions. As far as whole rock textures go, uh, there's quite a variety from banded pumice um, to, again, those discrete um, kind of felsic and more mafic or intermediate pumice with little blobs of some and the other. Sometimes it's kind of subtle and you really have to look around for it. I just highlighted what I can, could see in this uh, scan of the thin sections, and then there's other pumice that are just look at least homogenized um, in a hand sample. Now if we analyze the glass compositions within this tephra, which again represents the magma melt, um, we can see that there's a wide range of glass compositions from about 68% SiO2 to something like 78. Um, so you're going to see diagrams that look like this a lot throughout the talk, where I have the unit on this axis from the oldest eruptive unit to the youngest, and then different, um, different plots um, as we go. So pointing out a few of the details in here, like I mentioned earlier, there's some that just have one mode of the glass composition, like these ones I've highlighted. There's other eruptions that have a bimodal distribution of the glass composition, so we've got at least two glass compositions, roughly. There's some, some variability in there. And then if we just kind of look at the eruptive sequence, we can see that there is a general alternation between this hybridized, mingled, hybridized, mingled, and so on and so forth. And it's not perfect, but there is some sort of pattern going on there. Um, with some of those bimodal eruptions, there's some like SI that has really distinct glass geochemistry between the two of them. They're really different. Um, other ones that are a lot closer, a lot more similar in composition, but you can still pick out a bimodal composition there. 
And then there's some that might be uh, looking like we're getting some hybridization going on, but we haven't quite achieved it yet. Um, if we were to look at these, this SI and SS in the field together, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference just in hand sample, but then when we're analyzing that glass, we're starting to see that that glass or the melt of the magma was changing uh, before it erupted. And, and I also just wanted to briefly point out that um, we have a pretty good showing of these kind of rhyolitic or uh, evolved glasses in here. But when we're looking at the actual deposits, those only make up like a couple of percentage, a couple volume percent of the actual deposit. So it's really kind of this intermediate um, type of magma that is the dominant product of these eruptions. So, so far, this is kind of looking like what we've seen or what has been proposed by Tepley and others, uh, where we've got some sort of intermediate magma at depth and um, uh, that periodically interacts with this overlying felsic magma, those mingle prior to eruption, and then we get those mingle products. But there also seem to be times where uh, that intermediate magma just completely bypasses any inter interaction with that overlying felsic magma, um, and we get seemingly hybridized or homogeneous um, looking deposits. Um, and then also, we don't see um, the eruption of just the felsic magma. We only get like a little bit of a taste of it whenever it's sampled by that intermediate magma too. And then I chose to draw this um, reservoir a little bit bigger than the felsic magma, because like I said, the intermediate magma, at least what we see in the whole rock and the glass, is the dominant texture and the dominant composition. All right, so what can we learn from the minerals now? Um, I love the comparison of these tree rings to our crystals, where the oldest part of the tree is in the core, and then it grows outward, and we can learn about its growing conditions as it's going. And we can do similar things with the crystals, where the core is the oldest part of the crystal, um, and then that crystal is recording different conditions in which it's growing throughout its lifetime. And you'll be seeing some of these uh, backscattered electron images. So the grayscale um, basically represents different compositions within that crystal. Um, so we can even get just a first order look at what's kind of going on with these textures. So in all of the Pacheco stage sequence, we have plagioclase, amphibole, two pyroxenes, iron titanium oxides. I accidentally identified a few olivine that I wasn't expecting to find because um, they're so rare, but they're in there. Chemistry's great. Um, and then we can use the compositions of these minerals in order to, and mineral pairs and phase pairs, uh, to estimate pressures and temperatures um, at which that mineral was last in equilibrium with. So starting with plagioclase, plagioclase is a really great mineral because it's stable over a wide range of uh, temperatures and compositions, so it records a lot of what has gone on in a magma's history. And one of the ways that we quantify plagioclase major element compositions um, is with anorthite content, so that's just putting a number to the calcium end member. Um, so something that has a really high anorthite content is likely crystallizing in a mafic magma. Something with a really low anorthite content is probably crystallizing in a felsic magma, and then the intermediate ones crystallizing in some sort of intermediate magma. And you can see in the range that we have here that it's recording a wide range of anorthite content, so 25 to 84. Um, and this is showing, we're going to fill in the rest later, um, this is showing a stacked histogram of analyses from different parts of crystals from each of these units. Um, so the, the colored part is the core, the dark gray is mantles, and the light gray are rims. Um, so we fill the rest of those in, and we can start to pick out some patterns with these, like the glass, too. So um, across the whole sequence, all 10 eruptions, um, we see consistently three populations of high, moderate, and low anorthite crystals. And I've kind of artificially created these boxes, but they are you know, pretty, pretty consistent throughout. What's interesting about the high anorthite is that they are all restricted to crystal cores. So we don't see them in the rims, very rarely in the mantles. They're pretty much always in the cores of these crystals. Um, eruptions like PI and PG that don't have one of those rhyolite glasses makes sense, and it follows that we uh, don't see any low anorthite plagioclase. And kind of the converse of that when we have really large spreads in the anorthite contents, or sorry, of the glass um, compositions, we get really wide spreads in the anorthite contents of the crystals. 
And then lastly, it's pretty easy to see, I've highlighted it with this box, that most of the compositions are in that moderate anorthite zone. So kind of like we're seeing most of the intermediate magmas seem to be um, the, most, the most common composition in the glass and the melts and the whole rock, excuse me. Um, we see the same with the anorthite populations where it's kind of 50 to 70 is where all the maximums of these are. So if we're going back to our schematic here, now I've added in a mafic magma to our, um, to our crustal section based on those high anorthite cores. Um, and actually what I think was interesting, I'm going to keep showing you an example uh, from one of the bimodal eruptions that we can actually track the interactions between these three magmas. Um, so we see some that record growth in this more mafic magma with the higher anorthite content. There was a recharge event and now we record growth in this intermediate magma. We've got the same kind of idea between the intermediate magma and the felsic magma, where the rim is now that low anorthite composition. Got some that even jump all the way from 80 to 40s, or over 40% um, percent of a difference in anorthite. So we're recording growth here, and then growth in here. And then there's even some of the crystals that record all three. So we've got growth in the mafic, recharge event, growth in the intermediate, recharge event, growth in the felsic, eruption. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I also wanted to note that the fact that we don't see these high anorthite populations in the rims and that we don't see basaltic glasses, it's kind of telling us um, that those mafic magmas are really restricted to the deeper zones of the volcanoes and they're getting filtered out basically so we don't see mafic magmas erupting. So this all is kind of tracking together, it's like a big logic puzzle. Logic puzzle. Now that's all well and good, but um, anorthite content is sensitive to more than just the melt composition. It can change with changes in temperature or changes in the water. Um, so even though we're seeing really big changes that we wouldn't expect to be just from maybe some convection and that crystals recording growth in different temperatures of a magma chamber, um, we, I'll convince you the rest of the way maybe that this is uh, from magma mixing. So what we, what we can do is look at trace elements that are not as sensitive to temperature or water. So things like iron and magnesium are only incorporated into pelagioclase crystals because they're major components of the melt. Um, little caveat to iron, it can change a little bit from the oxidation, oxidation state of the magma, um, but it's not gonna be as much as if we have two really distinctly mixing magmas. So I'm gonna schematically put up here um, the slopes that we would expect to see if we put up individual um, analyses from individual crystals. So there's gonna be a bunch of lines. So if we're just thinking about um, how we would interpret what our samples look like, if it's just closed system behavior uh, with this flat line here, which means we're seeing changes in the anorthite, but it's constant iron. We're not seeing changes in iron. Or if we have just slightly elevated, which could be um, changed by the oxidation state of the magma, but relatively flat or relatively shallow could just be something like thermal mixing where there's um, some overturn in the magma chamber and it's just recording different temperatures, different oxidation states. Whereas if we have this really steep line, um, that is more indicative of two separate magmas that are then mixing together and we have crystals reflecting growth in both of those. So then I call this my abstract art, because that's what it reminds me of. Um, I've got this black dotted line was calculated by Rupert and Werner, and um, it's basically the maximum slope you would expect if you would just chalk that up to changes in the oxidation state. So if we have lines that are steeper than that, that's what we could say, okay, we feel a lot more confident that that is from magma mixing. And I've highlighted in red, I think this is just from one of my samples, but I think that's more than half of them are steeper than that line, so I would say that's another point for magma mixing. Okay, so summarizing everything that we've seen so far, we've got our mafic magma down in this deeper zone here, and I'm calling it cryptic because it's only recorded in those crystal cores. We don't actually seeing it erupted. We don't actually see it erupting at the surface. Oops. Um, we've got our intermediate magmas that are kind of the dominant, and we'll go a little bit more into this. Um, and then sometimes those intermediate magmas are mingling with these shallow felsic magmas but they're not always sampled, it seems like. Um, so I don't know if I chose to draw it kind of disconnected. I don't know if it's just an ephemeral melt, if there's disconnected melt pockets. I don't know exactly what it looks like, but I just know that it's not always erupting. 
Um, so if we look at these different scenarios, I've chosen to draw it a lot more complex like this rather than just one big magma chamber um, because we see so much variability in the products that are erupting throughout that whole stage. It doesn't seem like one composition um, or one big well-mixed chamber can, um, can explain the things that we see. So all of these Rs are recharge events, um, kind of representing different interactions um, between different types of magmas. And we've got, um, like with the plagioclase recording, growth in a mafic magma. That mafic magma recharges intermediate magma, and now we're growing intermediate rims. There's other times, and this, bear with me here, where it seems like we have mixing between two magmas that are just a lot more similar in composition. So the plagioclase that are growing within these magmas are also a lot more similar in composition. So it's a lot harder to pick out, but we can still see evidence of that. Um, this is one example from PI. Um, it was one of those bimodal magmas, the red one that I pointed out, that was separated by like three weight percent of silica. So they're just a lot more similar. So you would expect that the plage that was growing out of that would also be a lot more similar in composition. And we can track this population across, um, across that unit where we have kind of midway through, there's a lower anorthite place growing, or zone, excuse me. Um, and then there is a resorption event, which you could assume was from recharge. Um, and that's followed by growth in a higher anorthite magma. So we're still seeing magma mixing. It's just not as distinct as that other example that I showed. Um, so that's part of the reason why I'm drawing this so much more complex than before, just adding, adding to the complexity. And then again, sometimes those magmas are interacting with that shallow felsic one. And so this is just a summary cartoon to explain all of the observations that we see in these crystals. Now I'm going to cheat a little bit for the sake of time um, and tell you that based on kind of a similar thought process for the rest of the minerals, I'm going to tell you where I think those minerals were crystallizing. Um, so just based on the mineral compositions and some of the textures, um, I'm saying that the amphibole and the pyroxenes are crystallizing in the intermediate magma. They're just not consistent uh, with growth based on compositions and some textures that we see in a felsic magma. It could be that some of them are remnants of that mafic magma, but I just I didn't do the work to keep confirming that more, so that would have to be a future thing. Same with those olivine that I said I accidentally, I thought they were pyroxenes and then eventually analyzed them. Um, and they're just very tiny. I found, I think, seven or eight in all 10 units. Um, so it's just, I think, again, remnants of that uh, more mafic zone. And then we have iron titanium oxides that are crystallizing in all of these zones. So it was a bit of a marathon to get here, but uh, we've come a long way in really filling in what this diagram, uh, filling in the schematic and what we think is going on with the magma system. So we've got that mafic to the felsic magmas that are present. And just like in the 2K eruption, uh, the recharge and mixing are still well, represe well represented processes. We just see a little bit more variety in just that 2K end member. Um, and I haven't explicitly addressed this um, as an eruption trigger, but it's a common eruption trigger. And even just the fact that we're preserving those mingling textures tells us that this recharge is happening not too um, long before the eruption is actually occurring. Um, so the reason it was so important for me to, to define where these minerals are coming from is um, to interpret the thermobarometry numbers that we get for, um, for, the, mag for the equilibria pairs. Um, it's really easy to get a number from these calculations, but if you can't interpret what it means, it's kind of meaningless. Um, so one of the cool things that we can do is look at reaction temperatures and amphibole. Um, there's a few different types of reaction temp uh, textures that can form in different situations. The ones that we see at MISTI are um, in five of the units, um, and they, um, they're made of this fine-grained plagioclase, pyroxene, and iron titanium oxides. And based on experimental work uh, by others, we have a pretty good idea that these form due to decompression and volatile loss in the magma. So amphibole is a hydrous mineral, right? And if it's not at depth far enough with enough water dissolved in the magma, um, then it becomes unstable and it reacts with the surrounding melt. So another observation is this is, again, in La Rosada that I've been showing, uh, but this is just like the 2K eruption and a couple other ones. 
where we've got the coexistence of amphibole, these brown minerals, with the reaction rims, right next to ones without the reaction rims. And more often than not, we find the reaction rims um, in the amphibole that are hosted in that felsic glass that I've highlighted uh, with the yellow here. And so we can use the coexistence of these um, two textures to kind of work out a process and we can actually estimate a limit for where that felsic magma uh, is staged in the crust um, because we know they're not originating in the, in the felsic melt, uh, but we can use these. So we're gonna go back to this diagram by Tepley um, where we've got an andesitic reservoir somewhere below the stability limit of um, amphibole. So we've got nice, happy, unreacted amphibole down there. And what they proposed for the 2K eruption was at some point there was a small recharge event um, where that just kind of stalled somewhere above the limit of amphibole stabili stability. And we get the formation of these reaction rims due to decompression. But don't forget we find reacted and unreacted ones in the same sample. Um, so there must have been another more forceful recharge event where that magma came from depth all the way up to the surface quickly enough that no reaction rooms formed. So now we've got rims, or amphibole with rims and without reaction rims in the same sample, um, kind of recording this two-stage process. And if we look at magmas of similar compositions, people have done phase equilibria work where we can kind of put a limit on that stability field for our magmas at about 200 MPa. So based on that, our, our felsic magmas are above 200 MPa, so pretty shallow. Okay, so now we're gonna add in some of the thermobarometry estimates. Um, so this same thing, units with our pressure from about zero to 1,000 MPa, and these are all uh, barometry pairs that we can say describe the intermediate magmas based on which uh, minerals they are. Um, barometers have unfortunately large errors, but I was really surprised that throughout the whole sequence they were pretty consistent, um, which I d d wasn't expecting, I guess, over 20,000 years. Um, so this intermediate magma is crystallizing over about 200 to, we'll say, 600 MPa. Um, now we're looking at temperatures for all of the same um, mineral and phase pairs, except we're adding a plagioclase liquid if the liquid is the intermediate type. Um, and again, pretty consistent even throughout like a single barometer, or sorry, thermometer, throughout the whole sequence. A little bit of spread on that, um, but about 1,000 degrees plus or minus 100, I guess. Um, more temperatures, but this time, these are only for the bimodal magmas, and in the plagioclase liquid, I'm using the felsic liquid, so this is representing the felsic magmas. Um, and you can see now we've got our coldest magmas, um, our coldest temperatures recorded when we get, when we use this thermometer. So down to about 800 degrees to a little over 900. And what I thought was interesting were the temperatures that I got from iron titanium oxide pairs. Um, so those are now those little hexagons, and out of all of the thermometers, out of all of the single thermometers, we got the biggest range in the temperatures that are recorded with iron titanium oxides. Uh, so from about 800 degrees, which you would expect for one of those felsic magmas, to about 10,050 degrees, which is what you would expect for one of those intermediate magmas. Um, so kind of had me scratching my head a little bit, wondering how I was gonna interpret those, what are those representing? Um, so we're gonna look at this a little bit more in depth. So some things about iron titanium oxides. Well, I found touching pairs in all of the units, um, and trust me when I say I looked through that thin section scan, it's going up and down and up and down across entire thin sections. <sighs> um, I found touching pairs in all of the units, but there were some where I really struggled to find any um, because ilmenite, the, the titanium, um, oxide was absent in the more mafic magma, and the pairs were only present in the felsic end member. So I was, well, okay, well, what does that mean? Um, bear with me. We know some things about iron titanium oxides based on experiments um, where they re-equilibrate to new conditions really quickly, so on days to weeks. Um, and the pairs that were in, or all of the oxides that were in my samples, looked pretty compositionally homogenous. They weren't zoned, they were fairly happy looking. Um, so to me, that meant that either they've had zero time to re-equilibrate to their new surroundings, or they've completely re-equilibrated. 
So we are going to use um, the range and the temperatures that we see, the textures that we see in the rocks, um, and some ideas about the rheology of magmas when they mix in different proportions. Um, so Sparks and Marshall thought a lot about the rheology of a mafic magma and a felsic magma mixing in different proportions and what the viscosity outcome um, of those mixtures would be. So this is 100% mafic, 100% felsic, and then this is like a 50-50 mixture in between, so we're looking at different proportions. When we're in this region, uh, where mafic magmas are the dominant in the mixture, are the dominant end member in the mixture, hybridization is favored. Where they're kind of similar to each other in viscosity, they're gonna behave like much more similar fluids with each other, and then we're gonna get banding is favored. And then when the felsic, um, the felsic end member is in a higher proportion than the mafic end member, the formation of mafic enclaves is favored. Okay, so who cares? Um, we're gonna look at this 2K eruption and SI, and based on this lower, cooler temperature and the hotter temperature, one looks kind of like a felsic temperature, one looks more like that intermediate magma. Um, and we're gonna try to plot these magmas somewhere on this and figure out what they mean. So again, we've got that nice, um, oh, sorry, excuse me. We have a rhyolitic member that volumetrically is not making up very much of these samples. Um, and a lot more of the scoria, 99% of it basically. And that's usually these little blobs of, getting really technical, little blobs and wisps of the felsic melt within the mafic. And then the flip side of that, we have the 2K eruption, uh, which is a lot more banding. Banding is prominent. And we have tens of percent of that felsic component in that mixture. So you'll notice nowhere in this talk did I say that we were getting eruption of felsic magmas with mafic enclaves. So I don't think that in our interacting mixture, mixtures, we're having a high felsic, um, high ratio of the felsic to the mafic magmas. But something like the 2K eruption, um, where we've got banding, we've probably got more subequal amounts of the interacting magmas. Um, so we could kind of just guess, I'm not putting a hard number to it, but that we've got, uh, we're somewhere around this area. And then for sandwich inferior, um, based on the textures and based on that hot temperature, we're probably somewhere in the higher ratio of the mafic magmas. So we've got more of a hot mafic, more of a hot magma. Um, interacting with a cooler felsic magma, and that hot temperature is going to dominate the mixture, basically. It's going to thermally equilibrate to that hotter temperature. And what do you know? Our temperatures match up exactly with that. Um, so putting all of that together, based on the textures, based on our inferred ratios of that hot to cold magma, um, and the temperature patterns that we see, what I think these are representing is the temperature of um, the two magmas that have mixed and thermally equilibrated with each other. Um, so it's kind of the very last temperature that experienced rather than the temperature that it was sitting at, just happy in the crust. So back to our, our diagram, we've added in a lot of temperatures where we've got uh, felsic magma stayed shallow in the crust, somewhere around 200 degrees, and it's relatively cool. Uh, we've got this intermediate magma staged somewhere around 200 to 600 uh, MPA, and it's relatively hot. Um, and we don't have any direct measurements on that mafic magma, but we can assume that it's staged deeper based on kind of the textures and the order of textures that we've seen in some of our crystals, um, and that it's likely hotter, because that's what mafic magmas are. So we've already kind of worked out that we have these crystals recording this multi-step process of our uh, magma recharge and mixing and mingling and magma recharge and mixing and mingling. Well, we can apply diffusion chronometry of uh, magnesium and strontium in plagioclase to try to put a time scale to that recharge to eruption time frame. And in order to be able to use this method, uh, we need to know a few different things. So the first is the temperature at which the diffusion is occurring. So we want to know that temperature of the magma after mixing has occurred, but before eruption. Um, and lucky for us, we think that's what the iron titanium oxide temperatures are telling us. Uh, so we have a pretty good idea there. We need to know some about the way the trace elements partition into those, um, into plagioclase, as well as how fast those elements diffuse, um, and also need the anorthite content and the melt composition. So what we do is basically just measure transects along these crystals in these crystal zones 
where we've got here just schematically distance along the profile with increasing concentration on the left side. And this is what the profile looks like just initially. And then based on what we know about the way that these elements are partitioning, um, the way the elements want to partition into the crystal, we can estimate what an equilibrium profile would look like. And basically, that, that is basically the end point that the profile is striving to reach. So just a little animation here. Through time, that profile is going to change and try to reach equilibrium. So we can, we can model this, um, and we basically know what the profile should look like at different time steps. So then we can try to find the best fit for what our observed data would be. Um, so I've got my little, my little spot analyses on here. And so for this example, we could say, OK, T4 is the best fit time for how long that diffusion, how long it took for the, the profile to diffuse to that point. And we'll just revisit the simplified schematic of these crystals that record um, the interaction between that mafic and inter intermediate magma, and then that grew in the intermediate and the felsic magma. And just quickly looking at a couple of these profiles, um, again, this is the initial profile in the black. The dashed line is the equilibrium. The gray is our observed, and the green is our best fit. So for this one in particular, uh, we had a best fit time of about 50 years. Same, same type of plot here, but the best fit time is only at about a year, less than a year and a half, basically. And of course, we always want to have more than just one data point. Um, so this is all of the, uh, all of the diffusion time scales for strontium and magnesium that I have representing this um, crystal population and this crystal population. Um, and if we just look at the general trends between the two, we can see um, that the interaction between the deepest and that intermediate magma are generally taking longer, so kind of on the scale of years to decades, um, than the interactions between that intermediate and the shallow magma, which is more on the scale of uh, months to years. No, sorry. Eh, months to years, yeah. Um, either way, though, these are kind of on the scale of a human lifetime. Um, all of them, including the other two units that I've looked at, are recording times that are less than a, a century or two. Um, and then that final kind of recharge to eruption time scale of if we're thinking about the last event to occur is somewhere on the order of less than 10 or maybe 20 years. So pretty quickly. So we're coming around full circle now. Uh, we filled in a lot of this information. We've got some time scales that we think some of these processes are happening at, again, on the scale of a human lifetime um, generally. And I don't know if I would call them resolved, but we've got some, some pretty good progress on uh, working through these. And then just before questions, I wanted to make sure I acknowledge um, all the work that's gone into this project and previously, especially all of the Peruvian scientists and students over the years who have um, done especially a lot of the groundwork. So thanks. We have some time for a few questions, and Marie's going to do her best to repeat the question for our home folks as well. Questions, please. Carrie. Yeah, so uh, the question was, um, I mentioned that there's been some recent activity, and with that, are there ways that we can connect um, the fumaroles to some of the processes that, that I've outlined here? Um, and so, yes, um, there are a couple of things that you can look at with the fumarole would be the chemistry, so how much CO2 is in it versus just water and sulfur. Um, that can give you an idea of how shallow or deep the magma is. Um, they also monitor the temperature of the fumarole, um, and based on, let's see, I think the last study of it was in 2017 that said there was a thermal excursion where it got a little bit hotter and the gas chemistry changed a little bit um, that was consistent with the arrival of a, a more mafic magma to the, to the shallow region. Um, so that's one way with the fumarole. 
Um, there have been a few different periods of unrest in the last century. So the last one was in about 1980, where the fumarol started to, you could actually see it, I guess, from, from the city, um, which you can't normally. So it was picking up, picking up in steam. Um, and um, a few other periods in the 50s and the 60s that that was happening, but it always went back down to background. Um, and same with earthquakes, if you, um, we've, I'm hoping now that we've kind of got a little bit more information about where these processes might be happening, we can correlate the depth of the earthquakes um, to, to infer if we have a recharge event occurring. And then from there, it can take, based on the diffusion chronometry, months to decades um, to make it to the surface. So not on a, a, a tightly constrained time scale, but it's something. Anne. Um, oh. How do you know that all of these are from this mm. That's a good question. Volcano, so right. Yes, there's Chichani Volcano, uh, which is dormant right now. Um, and then there's Pichu Pichu, which is extinct and hasn't erupted for a while. Um, so this isn't the work that I've done. Oh, I'm sorry. Repeat the question. Thank you. Uh, how do we know that these, um, all of these tephra deposits came from Misty? Um, and yes, I'm not the one who has mapped these out, but Chris Harpel and other Peruvian scientists as well have basically mapped out the isopacks for the tephra fall deposits. And then we can see that they um, thicken towards Misty and they seem to have all been dispersed towards the Southwest. So that brings up another point that a lot of the tephra, I'm guessing just from um, the wind conditions at the time in the past thousands of years, that a lot of them seem to be dispersed to the Southwest. There are a couple that are dispersed to the east and kind of northeast of the volcano, so I might not have an exact complete section. Um, but that is what we're working with right now until we can get better dates as well, because it's hard to correlate where other eruptions fit in the section. Um, yeah, just a limitation right now. Um, not that I know of in this one, there is the 15th century ash and then almost at the modern, no, Fif mm. 15th century ash and then the eruption of Huayno Patina um, is almost at the modern surface, but that's above everything. Um, Chris is always hunting for carbon in the intervening paleosols to try to get some more dates on it. Um, very arid throughout history and there's just not a lot of carbon. We, we were sitting in a few outcrops just slowly scraping away the hillside for hours just trying to find a little bit of carbon but um, that's why we only have um, this is really well dated because there's a lot of lahars preserved um, and uh, pyroclastic flows where there is some carbon material in there. Um, yeah it's few and far between. Sorry I, I'm done Marie leading us through step by step. Okay. And this is where it comes back to my question. How do you get a mafic magma in a subduction zone? What? Go deep? That's the, sorry, I mean, yeah, usually yeah. you're assimilating. Right. <laughs> How do you get a mafic magma in a subduction zone? Yeah, um, so let's see. Yeah, I don't think I, I think I took the slide out of my bonus slides even. Um, that something special about the central volcanic zone is that we have really, really thick crust. Um, so most of what we're getting at the surface is these really evolved dacites and andesites because they're undergoing so much processing within that crust. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, the basalts are from subduction of the ocean oceanic continent. Um, dehydration of that plate melts the mantle wedge, creating these mafic magmas. Um, yeah. Okay. Megan? Why is it called sandwich superior? Oh, um, yeah, so the sandwich eruptions. Most important question. Also, why did you talk not address that correctly? Well, it's time, Megan. Um, so why is it called sandwich inferior and superior? Just because uh, within the section, these two were just separated by this teeny tiny um, maybe ash layer or maybe uh, paleosol. Uh, but we called that kind of the lower piece of the bread and the upper piece of the bread, and maybe. <laughs> so just the sandwich eruptions. <laughs> yeah. I didn't get to name any of these, so. Chris. You mentioned briefly about control of water, and I was wondering if there's like that lower, more mafic magma chamber, and if you have any constraints on kind of 
what the modern time and kind of ink magnets like have without really getting a really anish plaid with just because your ink is so higher water time. Right. But on the other hand, if it's too high, then sometimes you can cable down at the deeper levels. And I was just wondering what constraints you have on that. And then that, of course, just feeds into what drives the explosive corruption that you're on. Yeah. Um, Chris's question was, do we have constraints on the water contents, especially for the mafic magmas? Um, not very well, basically. Um, there's been a little bit of hygrometry for the intermediate magmas, where we see waters up to like five weight percent, um, but not a whole lot for the deeper ones. So that would definitely be future, future work. About two more. Um, my question is about the original map where you showed like the hazard map essentially and I was just wondering like uh, if there is a plan for that city like if they notice an increase in like activity is there a plan for like people to get out or what are they going to do about it? Yeah so the question is what is the evacuation plan if there were um, some future unrest at MISTI? Um, I know that there has been more recent campaigns in Arequipa um, to, to increase awareness that Misty is a volcano because there were people and there's people that I meet in the Cascades that aren't aware that we have volcanoes in our backyard. Um, so just increasing awareness that yes, Misty is an active volcano. Um, here are what the hazards are. And I think they've done some mock evacuations in the last decade or so. Um, and there was a study too about like what was the most effective media um, form of media to disperse this information is, and it seemed like print media was not very helpful, where all of their um, internet presence on, you know, their Facebook socials and everything were a lot better at dispersing that information. So they have they have been working to, because that is a lot of people to evacuate. Um, I mean, bigger than Seattle and, yeah. <laughs> David? Um, the question was, I mentioned the large error bars on the thermal barometers. Is there anything that I tried to do or that I can do um, to improve that anymore? Yeah, this is kind of a long-standing issue uh, with barometers. Um, some of the uncertainty, um, some of the uncertainty is because it's really difficult to measure sodium and that goes into, say, some of the pyroxene um, estimations. Um, it also depends just fundamentally how sensitive the different, um, uh, the different parts, different compositional end members of the crystals are to, to pressure, and they're a lot more sensitive to temperature generally. Um, there's a program called Thermobar, which I calculated all of these in, developed by Penny Weiser, Weiser, Weiser. Um, and she allows you to do Monte Carlo modeling in there too. Um, I didn't do that on these ones. Um, I don't know if that would necessarily, it would probably make them larger because you're considering a lot more other things. Um, so that's, as far as I know, kind of the state of just thermo or barometry in general. Hey, let's thank Marie again. We'll see some of you at 4.30 today. We'll see some of you upstairs in room 321. We'll see everybody March 1st. Thanks for coming today. Goodbye. Yeah, good job. thank you. You gotta feel good about that, don't yeah? you? Yeah, okay. okay, good. Totally. I think I blacked out, but it's <laughs> <laughs> good. I'll take the mic off yes. your lapel then. Have some folks to visit with you. Yep. Good job. Thank you, Nick. Thanks for sticking around, Jim. Good job. Good. Good. Good to see you at the basketball game for a little bit last night. So loud. I it mean, is so loud. I was trying yeah. to talk to Dennis. I could not yeah. hear him. Yeah. Well, I'm Dennis like, is so quiet anyway. Yeah. I have a hard time hearing him in domestic <laughs> situations. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. It was a, it was a
was a exciting game. Yes, it was. <laughs> totally. Well, thanks everybody for sticking around uh, for this episode. Over my shoulder is Chris Mattinson talking to John Lasher, and John has been a steady, enthusiastic, heavy machinery operator who's totally into this geology stuff and has been involved with Tyatan andesite work and many other things. And the university president and the first lady of the university continue to come to these things, which I'm always careful to point out because it's a great endorsement for what we're trying to do here. Um, yeah. So uh, it's going to be a few weeks before I see you next in this series. The next time I see you will be March 1st. And um, I don't know much about Anthony. I'm sure that he is not a professor. And so I'm guessing it's going to be some sort of engineering slash technical kind of project manager kind of talk. I don't really know, but there is a project underway on this campus in this valley <laughs> installing a geothermal energy system, which I didn't even really know was possible in this valley. So I expect a record crowd for that talk. And if you have a particular interest in geothermal energy and you want to talk with that expert in uh, whatever, visit with him afterwards or whatever, you're welcome to be here on Friday, March 1st. Otherwise, um, for some of you, I will be seeing you on Sunday. Not with this series, but with the other YouTube live stream series that I have been doing this whole winter called the Ice Age Floods, A to Z. And on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific, we are to session X. So I need to brush up on my alphabet, but I think that means there's only three shows left, X, Y, and Z. And so the guest on Sunday morning with Session X will be Dr. Scott Burns from Portland State University. And I need to do an audiovisual test with Scott at 2 o'clock from my office just to make sure. So, thank you everybody. I love you. And goodbye from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. X marks the spot, says Zoe. I sure would like to learn one more hand gesture before I quit. What if I do that? You know what? Does somebody, is somebody a Mac user out there? And do you know about this hand gesture thing to make all these options? I thought that was the laser thing. Oh, this. I want to learn a new one, and I don't want to look it up. That's no fun. Does anybody have a tip on how to do snow or something else? I can't even remember balloons. Is this balloons? Yeah. I'm sure I can look it up, but I, I want to be organic about it. I've, I have discovered all the rest of these just by accident. Devil horns. Was that, was that the laser? There. Yeah, you want to see more lasers, Megan? <laughs> I'm obviously cool. But I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to learn. Uh, two thumbs down is rain. I'm trying to learn one new one from the, from the, home, the home viewers.
Anybody got any sort of, before I say goodbye? Somebody furiously Googling right now? I think it'll, I'd love to do smoke, Peter. How do I do it? Two peace signs is confetti. Yeah, okay. I'm looking for something new. Out of the 283 of you, does somebody have a tip? Now I'm going to be stubborn. I'm not going to sign off till we figure. There's got to be at least one more that I can learn. It'd be fun to learn it from you right now. Yeah, I, we know conf, we, we know confetti. We know the double thumbs up. I've just done those, man. Two hands, all fingers open. I think I did that to John yesterday, like, goodbye, John. Nice idea, Oscar. Stand up and turn around. No, I'm, I think it's just hand gestures. I've already, timed, I've already tried the most obvious hand gesture and nothing happened. Now you're just playing with me. There's eight of those things. I think I know them all. Making glasses. Like drinking glasses? Come on, David. Where have you been, man? I know I've been. I'm a pro at that. Well, come on, I need something new. Fist pump. Fist pump. Eyeglasses. See, I, I'm at your mercy now. You, you, I'm just a monkey performing for you at this point. There's got to be one more. A-OK. -okay. If there's only eight, do I know all eight? Double bird. Okay, you want it? Nothing. That's a good idea. Oh, I've already done that. What are you talking about? Dry Docs 1967 says, I just happened to open YouTube. What in the, what the F is going on here? Tented fingers on one hand. What does that mean? Like that? Okay, I gave it the old college try. What can I say? Yeah. Thanks, everybody. I love you. And goodbye from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. I know they're yanking my chain. It's okay. Oh, we got we got a Liberty Gold discussion going on up there. I've already done it, Sharon. All right. Thank you. Goodbye.
We'll see some of you on Sunday morning. I got a lot of work to do between now and then.